Welcome to all of you. Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome to this conversation. I'm Ann Kelly. I'm Vice President of Government Relations at Ceres, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to our session today on what can only be called a historic Earth Week. One to be remembered, Earth Week 2021, in our warm-up conversation, one of my colleagues said it's a week of hip, hip, hooray. And I'm thrilled to be joined today by the CEOs of the We Mean Business Coalition. These are some of the change makers on the world stage. And some of you know, We Mean Business was formed in 2014 with the goal of representing the leading business voice on climate action. The coalition was vital to the Paris negotiations in 2015, was a co-founder of We Are Still In in the US and has been a standout leader for radical collaboration, both among civil society organizations and among business and government. So we're gonna have a conversation today about the significance of this Earth Week Summit put on by the Biden administration. We'll talk about the role of corporate advocacy. We'll talk about the role of operational leadership. We Mean Business has been notable in promoting programs like the Science-Based Target Initiative. And of course, in corporate advocacy, perhaps there's no better current example than the way in which they all mobilized, we all mobilized, to bring together companies to call upon the Biden administration to set a strong and robust nationally determined contribution for 2030. And as you know, 411 uh, companies and investors stood up to invite the Biden administration to give us the discipline of a strong interim goal. We couldn't be more thrilled with the 50 to 52% goal for 2030. So that certainly represents radical collaboration. Let's dive into this discussion. Let me start by introducing each of our speakers. Uh, we're thrilled to have all of you with us today and in no particular order. Let's start out. We have Peter Bacher here. He's the CEO of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. We have Helen Clarkson, who is the CEO of the Climate Group. Aaron Kramer, is president and CEO of Businesses for Social Responsibility, BSR. Mindy Luber is CEO and president of Ceres. Maria Mendelucci is CEO of the entire We Mean Business Coalition. Paul Simpson is CEO of CDP, formerly the Climate Disclosure Project, and Elliot Whittington, director of CLG Europe. A very warm welcome to all of you. We are gonna dive in. We're gonna talk about the significance of the summit. We're gonna talk about how it looks to leaders around the world. As you can all see, this is very much a global coalition. And we're gonna talk about the role of companies and what they need to do. But, but first, I really wanna just turn it over to you, Mindy, if I could, because you had a terrific conversation with special envoy John Kerry earlier in the week on Tuesday. And I just wonder if you can share information about the announcement you made regarding the net zero asset managers uh, and the significance of that. Thanks, Anne. And, and to my colleagues, this is a week of celebration. Uh, for all of us, uh, we struggle, we push, we fight hard to have real progress on the dra dramatic challenge of climate change. And it's been a long journey, certainly from the United States perspective, and my colleagues have allowed me in despite the backwards movement that we had for four years. Uh, but now I think we can all say we are not there. We've got a lot of work to do, but boy, has this past week been a week of progress. Uh, I'll also qualify it. I'm speaking from the US perspective, and that's why the wonders and beauty of this collaboration is we are all global organizations, but we live in different parts of the world and we look at things differently. And I think that's both a benefit and you'll hear that today. But admitting to the uh, easier to admit to being a US uh, collaborator at this point, uh, this was nothing short of a monumental and revolutionary week. And let me tell you why and answer your question. I mean, first of all, to have the United States back in, our collaboration has supported, we are back in, getting the United States back in, and we're back in. To have the country, the leadership, the president of the United States talking about a robust, fundamental different commitment to acting on the Paris Agreement is huge. And I think we accomplished that this week and I think it will have, and it's having a dramatic impact on other countries around the world. But we have stepped up as a country our president has. Secondly, what we have seen in the announcements this week is not only government moving forward, but as Anne just said, collaboratively, we just brought 410 companies into this debate 
profoundly part of the debate. And what we heard from the president and from Special Envoy John Kerry was moving forward, this is about collaboration. It's government and it's the private sector. So those 410 corporate leaders that stepped up and stood out and put their name on the message that we need to go fast and go deep has made a huge impact and is being noticed by policymakers around the world. And then finally, um, in a conversation, in a discussion such as this with Special Envoy Kerry, um, we also brought together members of the financial community. And sometimes we separate them, even though they're clearly part of the private sector and the corporate community, but 37 trillion new at dollars under management of asset managers, major players, whether it's State Street Global Advisors or Wellington Investments, joining BlackRock, joining the largest asset managers in the world saying we need to act on climate and we need to set specific goals. So the bottom line, Anne, is it was an extraordinary week for all of us seeing policymakers move, corporate leaders that we work with being invited in and the investment community moving forward like no other time in our history here in the United States. Thanks very much. And I look forward to hearing from my esteemed colleagues. Well, thank you so much, Mindy, uh, for those observations. And um, just for a minute over to you, Aaron Kramer, you're based in the US, but BSR obviously has a global presence. And I wonder if you have thoughts of how this week looks on the international stage. You saw the US speaking with China, Japan, uh, India, the EU. Would love to get your take on this whole week from a global perspective. Thanks, and I wanna thank uh, the coalition and series for organizing this. And it is indeed a great week. Um, you know, as an American who, who does work um, around the world, or at least virtually around the world these days, um, look, America's um, changing policy, particularly in Washington, states and cities are different, has been a big problem for over two decades, going back to the Bush administration or the second Bush administration. And the problem is that um, that instability provides a license for laggards to do less than we need them to do. The leadership that we're seeing now, if it is sustained, if it is sustained from Washington, will create incentives for leadership. And that's what we really need. And so, you know, I understand why many people around the world now apply to the United States, what the United States once said about the Soviet Union, trust but verify. I think people need to see that we will continue on this path because what business leaders need is consistent signals. I would rather have a consistent 80% signal than careening, seeing things careen back and forth between 100% signal and a zero or 20% signal. That just doesn't work. So um, I think we, we need that consistency. We need it on an ongoing basis. That is what um, will cause not only governments in Tokyo and Beijing and Delhi uh, need, uh, but also um, but also what, what businesses need. And let's, let's be realistic. Whatever you think about the integrity of the, um, uh, of the uh, assertions made by the Bolsonaro government in Brazil, they came because of the change in Washington. We saw something very different over the last few years. So this kind of leadership matters, but it has to be sustained. Otherwise, we won't have the kind of momentum that we need. Well, thanks so much, Aaron. And I think Aaron gave us our first few uh, tweetable quotes there. Let me just remind our listeners, we'd love for you to live tweet this session. We don't have the ability to take your questions in the chat. We will be sending each and all, every one of you a recording of today's session. And again, a special welcome to members of the press who are joining us. Um, Helen, over to you and the, the view from the UK. And let me take a minute and thank you and the Climate Group for hosting the platform this week for this dazzling US Climate Action Week. Would love to hear from you. And, and again, it was wonderful to hear from Boris Johnson yesterday and congratulations on the UK's NDC. Your take and how uh, your colleagues are looking at the summit this week from the UK's point of view. Thanks, Anne. Yeah, I, I mean, very excited. And, you know, I was thinking I was in um, India when the, the announcement of the Paris plot came, I was in China and then I went straight to India after that. And there was this real sense of, not so much in China, but in India of like, well, with the US out, we're going to have to reassess our position. So I think this point about the US coming back in and the signaling that sends the rest of the world, that's really, really critical. 
And I think the other thing is over the last few years, you know, we work with businesses and state and regional governments in a real sense that we could kind of patch this together for four years, but we couldn't do eight. And so I think this is, you know, really critical moment for, you know, that's been a very long time. It's felt a very long four years that the US has been out. So to come back in um, and then it needed to come back in with this real seriousness of intent. It, it couldn't just like slide into the back of the auditorium and hope kind of thing. We needed to come in, see the US come in with huge leadership. And, you know, I think the British government are doing fairly well with their diplomacy around COP, but you know, you need the US um, standing alongside that because while the UK is a historically bigger matter at the moment, it's, it's further down the table. So diplomacy, but you've got to have the US, you've got to have China there really pushing things together. And I think that's very exciting as we you know, go through the rest of this year. We've already seen big announcements from big emitters like Japan. I think that's really critical. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Helen. And, you know, Maria, you are heading up this entire uh, coalition, and I'd love to get your thoughts on the overall role of corporate advocacy as you look at all the things that have happened this week, and actually over the entire history of the coalition, your sense about the ongoing role of, of corporate advocacy in this space. Thank you, Anne. First of all, I want to congratulate you, Anne and Sophie, for this amazing work that you've done on pulling everything together on this letter. I think we all felt Americans this week. Um, we're very proud uh, of, of all of you Americans and we feel uh, Americans. So well done and we're welcoming you back and, uh, and hopefully for the decade to come. In the success of, of this letter and the advocacy movement that we started together, it's also showing the success uh, and of the coalition. And it shows that we are much uh, stronger and impactful if we work together. So the, the letter, but everything that went with the letter, because the mobilization started in January with uh, a letter that we all signed uh, on the New York Times. It followed by another letter that we sent to the US administration offering help. We also joined forces with an NGO open letter to Biden. And during these months, we will ramp up the ambition. And, and I believe that they were thinking about an NDC between 35% and 50%. And we have an NDC that is between 50 and 52%. So the letter that uh, yeah, we worked together on with our teams to, to convince uh, corporate America that had been quite silent before to step up their game meant that we had more than 400 uh, business leaders, 4 trillion revenues and 7 million of American employees that uh, that signed the letter and said to the Biden administration, you, you must be, be ambitious, uh, we will increase our ambition. So this reflects our theory of change as a coalition. So we believe that if we tell uh, governments, if the private sector backs ambition, government action, uh, and government action steps up the game, then uh, the business ambition uh, also increases and hence uh, the ambition loop. And it has worked and it worked in the EU, thanks to the great work that CLG and, and the partners have done. It has worked in the US. It has uh, had waves as we have seen in Japan and in other countries. And this is, this is what we do, but it's not only this that we do. I think it is important that, that everybody that is listening to this webinar understands that this is not a, a business of letters. We also have strong activities uh, on raising a uh, business ambition to net zero with the science-based targets initiative as a flagship project, the climate pledge or the 1.5 business ambition. We also work on system transformation, on renewables, electric vehicles, on the mission possible partnership to raise industry activities on buildings and on nature. And we certainly work and, and, and that's thanks to, to Paul on disclosure TCFD implementation, soon on transition plans and action plans like SOS 1.5. So I think the coalition has done uh, fairly well, thanks to partnerships also with many NGOs in the US. And this is just um, the start of a new era. And I think uh, we need to move from commitments now to implementation. And what I say, we need to move from commitments to accountability through action. So we, it's not enough to say that we have put some wind parks somewhere and that's wonderful. Actually, actually we need to show now that we are reducing the emissions too, so that we get 
to this minus 50%. So thank you all. Thank you for my colleagues. Uh, this has been a wonderful year with you and more to come. Thank you. Well, thanks so much, Maria. I think you speak for all of us when you highlight the need for commitments to go to accountability. Uh, you're absolutely right. And for our listeners, so many of the initiatives that Maria just outlined are available on the We Mean Business website if you want to check that out. I want to say all the references to back in, uh, warm our hearts from we are still in to we are back in. You should all know that movement is now America is all in. So do check out America is all in. The vast multi-sector non-state actor movement uh, was the meme that became the movement and is alive and well. You know, many of you heard Lisa Jackson, I think on Wednesday, when she said that government action and the Biden's initiative is the wind in our sails for Apple to move forward. And it made me think of you, Elliot, uh, over at CLG, because you all just did a stunning job mobilizing companies in the EU to get behind the Green Deal. And I just wanted to ask you about the ongoing appetite with uh, corporate advocacy uh, for companies in the U EU. Is it sustained? Is it real? And can you say anything about what Maria just mentioned about the difference between commitment and accountability? Over to you, Elliot. Thank you so much, Anne, and thank you for the kind words. Uh, yes, you're, you're quite right. We were able to mobilize. We haven't. We didn't quite manage to, so you, you built on our success with, with over 400 signatures to the US letter, but we had over 200 signatures, kind of businesses actively coming out and publicly backing the European Union's own target of 55%. And I, I would absolutely say that, that leadership is, is continued and, and, and we still see that kind of engagement from the business community. I think the shift is now we're, we're moving in, the conversation is moving from, from the target setting into the implementation. Um, when President von der Leyen from, from the European Union spoke, Yesterday, she, she talked a bit about the, the Fit for 55 uh, package, the kind of package of legislation that is trans will transform power and buildings and industry and transport and all those sectors of the economy that will need to change. Um, and, you know, we've been working very much with our membership in the Corporate Leaders Group and the wider community to engage in the detail in terms of what does that mean? How can we demonstrate business leadership? How can we move those conversations forward in a really practical way so that we're able to, to see real progress and real implementation take place? I think it's a really important thing that we were able to kind of continue on that um, on that footing, that we're able to, to do that because it's, you know, it's, you listen to the, the kind of remarks that are made by several leaders yesterday and, and indeed I think by President Biden and his, his remarks a few sort of minutes ago, this story is increasingly, you know, we're, we're having, we're in part of a climate summit, it's very much an economic summit, it is very much about the future of the economy. And as we, as we kind of build up to the big COP26 global summit moment at the end of this year, um, there is this sort of sense that we, the UN and others have organised this race to zero. And I think that, that it, it is becoming that. This is the future of the economy. It is where you're seeing more and more opportunities lie, more and more new industries being developed. So what we need is government and business to be able to work together to, to build those new competitive industries to, to really realign the economy. And that's a, that's a great story in terms of creating new jobs, creating new industries, creating new economic opportunity. And that's, there's, there's a huge amount that we can, we can all draw in different countries and around the globe on that issue. Well, thank you, Elliot. And you allude to something really important, which is the creation of new jobs and new markets. And I'm going to come back to you and others when we start to talk about this, this just transition, which I know We Mean Business has worked on. But first, I want to highlight what the CEO of uh, Siemens had to say. I don't know if you heard her. Barbara Humpton said, investors want to put their money where our goals are. And Paul Simpson, I know CDP has worked with investors for many, many years, and I'm wondering how that statement struck you. Is it, is it your sense that investors are paying close attention, in fact, to company goals? Are they willing to put their money toward those companies that are in the leadership class? And welcome to you, Paul. Thanks, Anne, and great to be here with this wonderful group of partners. Um, no, absolutely. We've seen the investment community, you know, part of the conversation yesterday was about finance and how do we finance the, the transition both at the government public policy level and the private sector and um, investors expectations of companies uh, have risen and risen and risen you know on disclosure through cdp more than 590 investors with 110 trillion dollars of cumulative assets 
are asking every company to measure and disclose through CDP in alignment with the task force on climate related financial disclosure. So that is just expected now from investors that companies will disclose, but investors expectations have been increasing. Investors want to see companies with net zero commitments. We have the net zero asset owners alliance, net zero asset managers, banking, like every group of investors is now themselves seeking to become net zero. That's a serious piece of work, it's not done yet but expecting their companies to do the same. Uh, so the expectations are increasing. Uh, we see them requesting science-based targets. And of course, there is a vast amount of capital uh, in, in, in the capital markets, and it's shifting from, it wants to invest in those companies with net zero targets, with science-based targets, and the transition plans to prove that. We have the Climate Action 100 Plus initiative that you at Ceres have been so instrumental in, the Stay on Climate initiative, a whole range of initiatives, but just send one signal from investors to companies that we expect you to be managing this, to measure, to disclose, to have these ambitious targets in line with the science and a plan to deliver them. And that is where the capital will shift. And frankly, for those companies that cannot live up to that is where increasing risk lies in the whole economy and for the investors. So, so, so that pressure is increasing, you know, from the disclosure, from the targets, from the plans through to the action. And that spotlight is getting tougher every day and capital very much willing to flow. And we saw just on Wednesday, the launch of the Glasgow Finance Alliance for Net Zero, another new initiative, but putting climate finance and net zero at the heart of the road to Glasgow and COP26. So this is not, that pressure from investors is not going away. And ultimately, who is going to hold companies to account? Uh, it's partly governments with the regulation. It's consumers, business consumers and citizens as consumers and also investors. And this, this focus of accountability, where many companies think the you know, investors are perhaps the most important. We could debate that for hours, but they're certainly critically important. Uh, is going to push more corporate action. You know, I couldn't agree with you more, Paul. And and you've underscored something important, which is investment risk. And we've we've seen in the U.S. now the U.S. government identify climate risk as a systemic financial risk. I'm going to return to that with you and Mindy and the investor point of view in a moment. But I do want to pull you in, Peter Bacher. Uh, great to have you here from the World Business Council on Sustainable Development. I think that you've said that this moment and President Biden's stunning infrastructure package and all of his initiatives and his will, uh, that there's, we really have a, a once in a generation opportunity, that his legislation is as significant in its scope and its impact as FDR's plan or as Lyndon Johnson's Great Society programs. Would love to get your broad view of the significance on that front of what President Biden is attempting to do and your sense as to whether or not companies are going to get behind him. Welcome to you, Peter. Thank you, Anne. And, and let me first say uh, hello to Mindy and Aaron. You guys can finally come back to our board meetings with your hats held up high. I'm so proud of you. Well done for moving at Derby. Uh, it was so refreshing this week to read articles in, in the international press where the words climate and hope were in one article. And, uh, you know, the, uh, the big summit this week has not disappointed in any way, so really well done. It's uh, probably want to lash on to what uh, Lisa Jackson said. The, the, the wind is in our sails. Uh, we should take this day to celebrate, as we do, and then we should put our hats back down and really lock it into the economic system now. Um, it's essential that uh, by the time we are in uh, Glasgow, the IFRS will announce the Sustainable Standards Board that we make TCFD mandatory in as many countries in the world, that we force companies to start disclosing this rather than for the 400 or so leaders to make uh, statements. We now really need to turn it into operating plans to really see where the dollars are being spent. We need to have conversations with investors that will actually be begin to distinguish companies who do have plans and make progress to get lower cost of capital. If we can lock those things in for which processes are now underway, then we actually will take this celebration and turn it into an, an improved economy. And if we can do that, then this is a meaningful day or a meaningful week, because then we finally get the system change that we need. We can move beyond just commitments and promises into the way the economy works. That's where this is so relevant. 
You're so right, Peter, and, and so important to highlight systems change. Uh, there's no question about it. And, and thank you for the welcoming back uh, to the Women Business Board meetings. We, we did hang our heads a bit these last four years that we are, we are uh, on top of the world right now, won't kid you. Mindy, let, let's return to this question about investors. And we've been hearing many, many times we've heard companies say they can't manage what they can't measure. Uh, Ceres for a long time has been an advocate of mandatory climate risk disclosure um, as a fundamental building block for building a net zero future. Your thoughts on where this movement is going? Are we going to hear this from the Biden administration as a mandatory element? And will we be able to get companies to support and also investors? The key behind this, Anne, and thank you for asking, I'll get to what the Biden administration is about to announce, or we believe, um, is taking climate, the, the Securities and Exchange Commission, as an example, just to be US-based for a moment, uh, is required to have companies that are publicly traded to announce, to disclose, what are real risks to the companies? Because investors are otherwise driving blind. You know, for them to make decisions, they need information. And CDP has provided enormous amounts of information. Um, but in the United States, how, how to make that consistent, mandatory, where every company, every company has to do it. And that we stop looking at climate risk as a special environmental risk that we only worry about on some days. Climate risk is akin to trade risk and currency risk and inflation risk, and it needs to be considered as such. And so the federal financial regulatory system, which goes well beyond the SEC, is now starting to look at how to address climate. The SEC is looking at mandatory climate risk disclosure. The Federal Reserve is trying to catch up with so many of the actions in France and the EU and others on making sure climate risk is seen as the economic systemic risk. Uh, the Commodities Futures Trading Commission, the Secretary of the Treasury. Who would have imagined, as we saw in a speech by Janet Yellen yesterday, that the Secretary of the Treasury is looking at climate risk as a major risk? And so I would argue the world has changed with this new administration. Rather than thinking of climate change as only something the EPA or the Department of Energy should do, and they should, and they are, we need to be looking at every federal financial regulatory system, and we are, and the discussions are being had literally every day as to how to integrate climate risk into those structures. The administration, I believe, is about to come out with an executive order on a number of federal financial regulatory systems led by the Department of the Treasury, the Secretary of the Treasury. And so the change, like what we saw this week, as it relates to federal financial regulators, I think we'll move at as expeditious a speed. It will be monumental change uh, and it will happen, I believe, over the next several years. It won't be easy. Like everything else we're saying, you know, we've seen a lot of new commitments. There will be push, there will be tug, there will be people opposed to these things. It really is incumbent upon this group and many others to stand up for the changes that are being considered as we move forward, because they're monumental, but they won't come easy. But it is time to look at climate risk as a material financial risk that our regulators, as well as our systems change leaders uh, are addressing. And I think we're starting to see that and we'll see more imminently. Well, thank you, Mindy, and, and more tweetable quotes embedded in Mindy's statement. Thanks to all of you who are live tweeting today. We were struck that both Apple and Salesforce came out in the last two weeks in favor of mandatory climate risk disclosure. Paul, I know we've been talking about the US system and I know it's different elsewhere, but I'd love your take on overall, where are we with mandatory climate risk disclosure? Do you feel as though investors are gonna to continue to demand it? Are companies going to get behind it in other parts of the world? Yeah, th thanks, Anne, and I agree with what Mindy said. Mindy, it reminds me in 2010, 2011, Sears and CDP were engaged in the SEC, and the SEC put out some climate disclosure guidance, not a rule, but guidance. Well, now is the time for rules, uh, as you have said. And certainly, you know, as I said before, climate disclosure is an expected norm now uh, from, from every company. Last year, 9,600 companies around the world disclosed through CDP. That's more than half the world's market capitalization. And 75% of the S&P 500 from a market-led disclosure system. But we, we do need mandatory disclosure, and there's great progress on that. 
the task force on climate related financial disclosures recommendations because it was the financial stability board have really put risen uh, climate disclosures to the heart of the financial system discussions uh, and we have good news new zealand was the first country to make climate disclosure mandatory in, in line with the TCFD. In the UK, actually in 2006, it became uh, the law that large companies had to start disclosing their emissions, but only their emissions, that, that's not enough. We need more information than that. And late last year, the UK government has made the TCFD mandatory and they're bringing that in a phased approach. Large listed companies this year, 2021, must disclose in accordance with the TCFD, rolling that out across the whole economy through to 2025. So it's fantastic to see this dialogue is happening all around the world. The EU has the non-financial reporting directive, will upgrade that, and again, align with the TCFD. Uh, in China, they are discussing uh, a directive, a mandatory directive on environmental, social, and governance disclosure. So it's great to see this again picked up in the United States, climate risk uh, disclosure legislation coming back from Senator Warren and others. And I think it's only a matter of time. Peter talked about the international financial uh, reporting so setting up to so the sustainability standards board to, you know, more than just climate but starting with climate what is required in terms of accounting standards around the world including sustainability so this is not a if it's a when and i always say that climate disclosure is the foundation of climate action we wouldn't fly an airplane without a set of instruments we can't run an economy and manage climate risk and opportunity without the information so we need this foundation quickly and i have complete faith in many other governments even by november where we have cop 26 announcing they will make climate disclosure mandatory and uh, i'm pretty confident with colleagues on here we might even have a chance of having the us in by that point in time well, yes, indeed, Paul, thank you for your comments. And you are right, this is foundational, this is important. So I wanna to turn to other colleagues on the panel, invite anyone else who might wanna jump in on this topic before we move on to a few others. Is there anybody who wants to add to this conversation? This is, by the way, for our audience, it's completely unscripted, unrehearsed, uh, but we'd love to hear from others if you'd like to weigh in on this vital question about mandatory climate risk disclosure. Anyone? Yeah, I, yeah. Thanks, Anne, and and thanks everybody. I think this is crucially important. I would just add that the momentum from policymakers is obviously crucially important. But what's interesting to me is I'm hearing boards look for this. They understand the importance of this. So the typical dynamic where you have uh, regulators looking to push requirements and companies' first instinct being resisting that's not what we're seeing so much anymore. Salesforce and Apple were mentioned, um, but, um, but we see it in lots of places. We've seen Unilever, Nestle, and Shell all put their transition plans to their shareholders for votes, not yet binding in all cases, but so there's momentum from businesses. They understand which way the wind is blowing and they want to help, uh, they, they want to get there because they understand that it's in their interest to do so. And that's a big shift. Uh, that that's come in the past, I, I wouldn't even say a few years, I would say in the last year or two. Well, thanks so much, Aaron, for underscoring the role of boards. Several of us have worked on corporate governance for many years, and this is a top-down issue. Climate change is an issue of governance, so that's really good news you've just reported. Anyone else want to weigh in on climate risk disclosure? Peter, go ahead. Yeah, I think what is, what is critical in, in those of us working with companies is to now really get the CFO community on board of this conversation. You know, the, the CEOs are there, they're making the big speeches and promises. The CSOs understand the topic. But if you really dive into the finance columns in companies, you often need to do a lot of missionary work to say, uh, why is this important? And, and again, it's, it's what Paul said, until we have the metrics to make better decisions in business, better decisions won't be made. And that's where... The, uh, the CFO role will be critical. Secondly, we really must work with investors to ask much tougher questions. You know, the, the big difference in this type of information is it's gonna be forward looking information. The, uh, the questions that investors must now ask is, what part of your research and development budget is actually gonna to lead to carbon emission reductions? And by changing the dialogues, between investors and CFOs is where the, we're going to change the decision. Yeah, absolutely. The vital role of chief financial officers, Mindy. 
Uh, Mindy, I think that you're on mute. Can you just unmute your And mic? I think you're right. How many of us have been told that 14 times a day? Certainly I have. Um, thanks, Anne. Um, to build on what Peter said, it, it's also the general counsels. As a lawyer, I know what we advise clients is less is more. Don't write anything down that you don't need to write down because somebody is going to find fault with it. And so it is quite important to engage with the whole ecosystem. It's not only CFOs who are crucial. Um, it, it is the lawyers. When we just finished the Commodity Futures Trading Commission report, um, where we had 32 different members of the commission, mandatory climate risk disclosure was shocking, surprisingly more controversial than it should have been. In the end, we did have unanimous support for it, um, but there was always a sense of you never wanna say more than you should. So um, let me be clear, all of this is always a battle, but I think we're on it, Peter is, uh, so clear, we need to be dealing with CFOs as well as CEOs, strategic planning, the investor relations folks, as well as the general counsel. The other thing Peter mentioned is investor's role. I mean, as it was mentioned, we've brought together 530 investors under Climate Action 100 Plus uh, with $55 trillion in assets under management. That's half the economy. And those investors very, meticulously said, who are the largest emitting companies around the world? And we've focused on 100 and then added 60 more, so it's CA 100 plus, 160 companies, the largest emitters. And our group of investors, which is 550 deep and works and meets regularly, is meeting with each of those companies and saying, you've not only got to set global goals, but you've got to talk about how you're going to meet them as it relates to your policy positions, your board governance, your practices. And this year we did a benchmark for every company that has made a commitment, is it real? How firm, how clear, how transparent to the public? So I, I'm with Peter, we wanna see goals from both companies and investors, but we've got an obligation to benchmark that, to work with the companies and investors in how to get from the goals to the details and then to benchmark it publicly. So everybody has a credible position on whether they're aligned and ready to meet those goals. Well, thank you so much, Mindy. And I, I do wanna highlight that we have one member who's not with us today, the B team. There are seven members in the We Mean Business Coalition. And I wanna underscore their leadership in particular on a topic that uh, Mindy and others have just alluded to, which is as we transition to the clean energy economy, we need to have a just transition for workers. And I'm going to invite the panel's thoughts on this question. Many of you heard, and this is something the B team has talked about a lot, but many of you heard Secretary Granholm on Wednesday, and she was quoting Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia, who had said, my coal workers can make the best damn wind turbines you've ever seen if you just give them a chance. And of course, you know that West Virginia is going through a vast transition. Many of you work in places around the world that have had to move from coal to wind, to renewable energy. Opening up this question for the panel, thoughts on how we can better facilitate that just transition, which is so vital to the clean energy economy. I think I see your hand, Elliot, go ahead. So, I mean, I think it's a fundamentally important question and it, it goes to the fact, I, I, the, it feels like the golden thread through everything we've been saying is that this the, the climate issue is absolutely a mainstream issue. It shapes the future in terms of risk, it shapes the future in terms of opportunity. And that, that's how we need to think about it. We need to think about it, it will it will have an impact across the economy. And that means new jobs, different jobs. It means different ways of living in, in different communities. I think often when we talk about the just transition, we, we're very focused on the downside. And there is a downside, we should not negate that. We should talk about it. But there is also really important upsides that actually, as we move forward in some of these ways, we can have better connected communities with with cleaner air, cleaner water, you know, uh, more enjoyable uh, lives, um, better jobs as well. And there is a huge upside in terms of the jobs that can be created. In fact, some work that we did um, in Europe where we looked at all the different factors that were affecting the jobs market. And um, yes, the climate transition will just, will um, absolutely destroy some jobs and will create other jobs, but also digitalization and the role of technology and, and you know, this kind of, 
the, the, the spread of the internet, also demographic change, also trade patterns. All of these things, many of them will have a bigger effect on the job market. And what's great about the climate transition is that if we if we lean in, lean into that, we can create jobs for those communities and those those people and those demographics, which some of those other factors will be destroying jobs. So so we shouldn't we shouldn't get stuck into the idea that the climate transition is is something that we need to um, kind of you know completely worry about. But it is obviously for certain communities and for certain certain groups. So particularly communities very dependent on coal. Um, which we talk about a lot, but also, you know, in maybe in some of the other kind of key manufacturing sectors, we will need to think about that and we will need to think about, and that's where government and business really need to, to work hand in hand. And there is some great stories of leadership from the business community about that, and also from some of the kind of local and national governments. Well, you're absolutely right about government and business working together. Of course, that was a theme of, of Wednesday's session, and that's a theme of, of our work every day. Other thoughts on the just transition question? I'm looking at the panel. Helen, jump in. Yeah, just a quick one. It strikes me we're nearly three quarters of the way through this, and we haven't actually mentioned COVID, which makes this a doubly strange event for the year, celebrating the US being back. But that's critically important because to, to just build on Elliot's point, the other big change is how much money is coming into the economies now and how much money is going to be spent. Um, and I think what's really critical as we get into this next phase on climate and the um, COVID expenditure and the green recovery is our work with businesses and governments in particular to kind of hold their hands through not making the easy decisions because you know you've got all these plans over here, you've got all this money over here, but still kind of agencies and, and ministries are used to spending money in a particular way they're used to making decisions and they're used to things like you know jobs right at the front and what do those jobs look like and that's right but understanding what those jobs look like so we've had this classic example in the UK at the moment um, going on around a, a proposed new coal mine which is for steel and you've got so you've got central government. Luckily, actually, what the big breakthrough, I think, is that you've actually got people in central government who are supposed to care about it being cross about it. That feels like a step forward. So at least the ones who are supposed to care do. But the news hasn't quite reached out to every corner of our tiny island yet about what this plan means. The fact that, you know, they were saying, well, but the license is only till 2049 and net zero is in 2050, right? So that's fine. It's like, no, it doesn't work like that. So there's now a planning inquiry this is what change is going to look like and I think we've got to hold our nerve in the climate community and work with it's very tempting to just you know jump on Twitter throw brickbats and so on and we need to do that in the right place but I think as we go through this next period of disruption there's a lot of money to spend and I think we can help working in partnership to figure out how that is spent how we tie these two threads together of recovery and climate. Well, I appreciate you mentioning uh, COVID, Helen. You're, you're absolutely right. We got this far, 45 minutes, and we had not mentioned the, the tragedy that we have all lived through this past year. Um, and, and you're right. It absolutely affects the just transition conversation. It certainly affects the equity conversation, which is front and center to what the Biden administration has put out. I want to keep this topic alive and invite others who might want to jump in. Uh, I see your hand up, Aaron. Thanks. Um, so a quick past, present, and future look at this. Uh, three years ago, almost three years ago, at the Global Climate Action Summit in San Francisco, BSR was asked to bring a discussion forward on just transition. We didn't succeed. No one wanted to touch it with a 10-foot pole. Um, companies didn't want to talk about it with a couple of small exceptions, or not small companies, but a couple of exceptions. Today, and let's remember the other thing that we haven't touched on today, and this is largely but not exclusively a U.S. issue, we had a major verdict this week on uh, the, the murder of George Floyd, police accountability, racial justice is front and center and needs to be. And so I think we also have to think not only about a just transition, but climate justice, climate equity. We have to make sure that, that this is an equitable uh, transition to, to, net, to net zero. And if we think then look at the future, if we don't get that right, ambition will have a ceiling on it. If we don't convince our fellow citizens that there is reason to believe that the clean energy economy is going to be fairer with opportunities for all, livelihoods for all, and probably and, and addressing or redressing uh, the environmental damage that has been done to a lot of communities, 
then there simply won't be the political will uh, to, to achieve the goals, the very ambitious goals that have been set out. And this is, this is also obviously uh, a global question and we haven't talked about climate, global climate finance much yet. We have to get that right as well. And so I think the question of climate equity, be including just transition, but beyond it has to be a central part of what we're trying to do. I think there's more momentum now, um, but, um, but I don't think we're where we need to be on these questions. So more work is, is needed. Absolutely, Aaron, could not agree more. Uh, there's no question about how central this is. And many of you know, uh, a centerpiece of uh, President Biden's plan is something called Justice 40. And that is a, a commitment that 40% of all benefits, not just funding, all benefits that derive from his climate plan will go to disadvantaged frontline communities of color. So thank you for underscoring that, Aaron. And thank you for underscoring the profound significance of the decision in, um, in the George Floyd case. Um, other questions, other input on just transition or the equitable questions, either uh, micro or macro, uh, local or global, anyone else wanna jump in on the questions we face? Uh, because obviously climate change is profoundly a question of justice, not something everyone takes up in the business sense, but it's certainly front and center for all of us. Okay, Mindy. One thing to build on is something we could each do, whether we're advocates or neighbors in a community. In the United States right now, and I think in many countries around the world, there are initiatives to put money back in the system to respond to COVID, and to climate. In the United States, as part of President Biden's Build Back Better, there will be an infusion of somewhere between a trillion or two trillion dollars around infrastructure around change. It is crucial that A, that be supported and move forward, and then it's done with justice intertwined throughout it, as you said. I mean, the reality is this is not just about jobs for wind farms. It is about how we spend that trillion and a half dollars. Is it about more highways? or is about mass transit in communities that have been deprived of appropriate transportation. We could look at every part of our economy. Where we put this money right now is gonna determine whether or not we have a clean and a just future or we don't. This has to be about job training, about bringing people up starting in high school, not only starting yesterday. Um, how do we build an economy that's built around addressing climate and built around addressing equity. It can be done, it is clear. There will, like everything else, be pushback. There will be things loaded onto the bill that aren't climate friendly and that are not equitable. Every one of us needs to be thinking about and every citizen. This is the time of a road taken or not taken. There are two options. That money could be spent right now just on infrastructure projects that will lock us into a fossil fuel economy or it could radically change our future where that trillion and a half dollars or so is spent on building an equitable and clean future with the right jobs, the right energy systems, the right locations for pipelines or not, um, the right transportation efforts. The time is literally now when that will be debated in the United States. Well, thank you, Mindy. And, and speaking of the right vision for the future, Peter, I know you have an initiative called Vision 2050. Would love to hear some of the details about that and whether part of your vision is, is there an equitable strain there? You mentioned earlier the difference between missionary work and, and the hard, cold economic soundness of decisions that CFOs make. Talk about your vision for 2050 and is there an interim version for 2030? Yeah, thanks. Uh, we've published a thing called Vision 2050 Time to Transform, in which we basically say there are three global challenges. Climate emergency, obviously, the good news this week, the loss of nature and inequality. And only if we transform systems to deal with all of these three challenges at the same time, will we come to, to the world that we need, which is nine plus billion people all living well within the boundaries of the planet. And in practical terms, what you now begin to see is that this year, not only COP26 will be held, but also the UN Food System Summit will, will happen. Particularly there, you begin to now really see how can we incentivize farmers to sink carbon into the soil, through that increase their livelihood and their, therefore uh, their income, 
And so how, what can we do to, to stimulate biodiversity, reduce emissions and create new income? It's that type of system thinking. And that's similar to what Mindy and others said is, we can't just focus on emission reductions. We need to look at job impacts as well as at biodiversity impacts that the world is gonna need. So that's the way forward, system transformation. System transformation, absolutely. And one system we have to change is the transportation system, which we hope to electrify in the US. And, and Helen, you have worked extensively with EV100 and pushing for electrification. Any sense of the progress toward moving towards zero emission vehicles, electrifying transportation in the UK and elsewhere? Yeah, and actually, um, Aaron mentioned the summit that we all worked on in 2018. And there's been so much progress since then. So we were running EV100 at that point. We couldn't get, and not just us, but others, we couldn't get a vehicle manufacturer to stand on stage and announce the end of the combustion engine. Um, and now, since then, we've seen a lot of shift, and that's come from different places. So EV100 aggregates the demand signal from corporate buyers. It's different in different markets, but somewhere like the UK, more than 60% of new vehicles on the road in any year are bought by corporate fleets. They can look at the whole cost of the over the vehicle lifetime, and that's what drives the second-hand market. So most people here buy their cars from cars buy their cars from vehicles that have come through there. So by switching out the corporate fleet, you can really have an impact uh, on the market. And so then what we can do is aggregate those numbers and start to push both on supply side and on government um, and government policy. So last year in the UK, we brought together a group of British businesses that were committed, created something called the UK Electric Fleet Coalition and put a lot of pressure on the UK government to bring forward their end date to 2030, which they announced in December. So that was a great success part of their COP leadership, getting them to push some of these agendas. And they can now take that out to other places and push on other, other governments. And we're doing that now with others in the EU. Similarly, California have set an end date of 2035. And so just in like two, two and a half years, we've just seen a, a tremendous amount of progress. And I think the end really is in sight there. So that's a good cause um, for optimism. And part of that story actually is really giving governments the confidence, like all these businesses are here, they're ready. They're just telling you, they just want you to change, you know, because when we talk to members, we can say, well, what's your biggest barrier to achieving these goals? And they say, it's the lack of supply. There just aren't enough vehicles to meet their demands. They would buy them, or buy as many as, as can be produced. So government's putting that end date in there, really strong signal to shift the supply side. And as I said, we've now had lots of commitments over the winter, they started to come from manufacturers. So really a lot of progress. Tremendous progress and a great news story. Anyone else want to comment on the transition to electrified transportation? There is good news to share throughout. That's a good news story. This group doesn't shy away from hard questions. So let me pitch one that I know is in, on the minds of our listeners. As we think about US and EU and UK leadership, we continually get a question on Capitol Hill around what about China and India? Anyone want to tackle that? How do you frame that question? How do you respond to the tired notion uh, that the US and Europe shouldn't move faster than some of our other partners in other parts of the world? Thoughts from anyone? I have my own response, but I'd love to hear yours. Um, I mean, one is worth noting that whilst the US was paused from the Paris Agreement, China and India kept moving forward. So let's really recognize that. And uh, you know, China has a net zero by 2060 goal that it came up with last year. And uh, you know, we heard this week that Xi Jinping saying we're going to phase up coal faster and phase down coal faster. I mean, there's a big deal for an economy. You know, that's in different stages of development. So uh, we also see that obviously, if you look at the supply chains of many U.S. or European businesses, where are they? And they are in emerging economies and, and China and India. So uh, India is doing amazing things with renewable energy. I, I think it's fair to say no country is where it needs needs to be yet. You know, some people say, well, the U.K. is very far. We're, we're not. We don't have a complete plan for net zero. Um, you know, the U.S. has paused and come back. So I, I would say, you know, China and India signed up to the Paris Agreement. We now have the US back in the Paris Agreement. Every major economy is in the Paris Agreement and we're kind of full throttle ahead on delivering on it. Each country will move at slightly different rates depending on their, where they are in their development. But China's 20, uh, net zero goal for 2060, the five-year plan, the, the commitment to phase down coal is enormous. What India is doing on renewable energy and also phasing down coal 
also in India now renewable energy is cheaper than like most uh, economies is cheaper than coal um, so yeah and we've all got to work together the whole spirit of the Paris Agreement yeah and we then get into this ambition loop of companies doing more investors doing more governments doing more yeah ultimately leaders are turning up at these summits and there's a little bit of competitive element we need to show we can do more that's that's the way these summits work that's the way cop 26 is going to work so i, I think personally i'm very positive about the, the enormous developments in india and china and we should see them as partners in addressing climate change well thank you for that rapid and enthusiastic response paul I, i'd love to bring you to capitol hill with your beautiful accent and to talk to my colleagues about that very question i love to say that china's emissions went up because they're making our stuff let's just be candid uh, a, a note about offshoring there time for the lightning round i need another hour with this group because there's so much to say but i'm going to give you each about 20 to 30 seconds and you're your task is really to comment on what is the message you'd like to give to the global business community at this point. And you can speak to either the corporate community or the investor community about what they need to do in the next, and I'm gonna be very short term, in the next six months. We have a phenomenal opportunity. Uh, the CEO of Siemens, Barbara Humpton said, you know, our, our hair is on fire as she counted the days to the end of the Biden administration, meaning we have very little time and we need to act quickly. Your guidance, I'm going to call on you based on the way you appear on my screen, and I appreciate your spontaneity here. You weren't ready for this question, but 20 seconds, your message to the corporate community at this moment about what they need to do with the help of We Mean Business over the next six months. Uh, Mindy, I will start with you and put you on the spot. Thank you. Uh, my answer is it's about scale and scope and details. We've got great commitments. They're honest. They're meaningful. Let's make sure that for every company, they turn those commitments into very clear plans for how to get to that net zero. Can't start in 2040 for a 2050 goal. We've got to be looking at short, medium, and long-term critical and transparent goals. Thank you, Mindy. Over to you, Maria, on behalf of the entire coalition. Thanks, uh, and just a, a quick comment that you can, you can see how much fun it is to be in a board meeting with all these. <laughs> colleagues. Um, I hope uh, that now we move, um, that the market rewards um, um, climate action, uh, emission reductions. And when I mean market, I mean the business, so providers, uh, and, and so, uh, suppliers, investors, and the consumers. Thank you. Thank you. Helen Clarkson from the Climate Group. Well, if you haven't made a commitment, it's, it, you're very late, so make one. Um, and and then really, I agree with Mindy, it's about to-do lists. We've got to start really translating those into immediate action plans. And I think some of the things we've been talking about here around engaging internally, those bits of the organization you haven't reached yet, that's a good place to start. Thank you, Helen. Peter Bakker. Yeah, I would say science is clear. And by the way, we'll very soon come out with even more urgent calls for action. Policies direction is now clear and getting more and more uniform around the world. But we have to realize that unless business change course, none of these reductions will be delivered. So it's really up to us now. We business need to move. We need to implement. We need to be held accountable. And then we're on a really good celebration. All right, thank you. And, and audience members, please keep tweeting. Uh, Paul, over to you. Yeah, I agree with others, but make commitments in line with the science, publish your plans to achieve them, disclose annually, and push your policymakers, your customers, your suppliers, and your investors to all do more. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Paul. And Elliot? It gets harder as we go along, doesn't it? I, I would say, look, you know, that we are seeing a growing number of companies who are the kind of major companies of the future and they are green companies. So if you're not already on track to become one of those, you should think about how you're going to. And you should use this moment, this moment where the spotlight is on climate change, to use your voice, use your leverage, you know, engage with your supply chain, engage with governments, call for a carbon price, all of those kind of things that business can do really credibly and effectively. You have a megaphone now, use it. Absolutely. All right. And our wrap up is you, Aaron Kramer. Final word. So I'm going to I'm going to adapt the great American novelist, William Faulkner, who said the past isn't dead. It isn't even the past. When it comes to climate, it the future isn't the future. It's here today. Build it today. We have to turn from ambition to action. 
Well, thanks so much, Aaron. We are the people we have been waiting for. Thanks to all of you and our listeners. I hope you'll join me in thanking all of our speakers. You will all receive a recording of today in the next 24 hours. Thanks for joining us for Earth Week. Thanks for joining us for this session. And thank you for your commitment to climate action. Thank you.